Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Short verse. I read it last week if you were here. This is what it says. After removing Saul, he, he being God, made David their king. God testified concerning him, saying, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Again, he says this, God testified concerning David, saying, I have found. It's important for you to know this, that if he says he found someone, that means that he was looking for someone. And I don't know about you, I want to be the type of person that God is looking for, right? I want to be the type of person, if God's seeking after someone, looking to find someone, I want to know what that type of person is. And this is what he says, the type of person he was looking for, he had found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. A couple weeks ago, we kicked off this series, Heart of the Matter. And what we're doing over the next few weeks, in the last couple weeks, we've been going through what it means to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. I don't know if you know this or not, but we need to make sure in life we live with the right goal in mind. I think a lot of people, what can happen is we can get to the end of our life and we can realize we were chasing something or doing something that God didn't really care about. You know what I'm saying? And you know what the life of David does? It helps us put into focus and it helps put into position what is God looking for? What is God asking for us to do? And this is what we said last week. This was my big idea. When you know God's heart, you will want God's will. See, God has a specific plan for you. He has a specific purpose for you. He wants to do good things and great things through your life. But you need to know this. If you are going to do the things that God's called you to do, you first have to understand that you have to know his heart. Because this is what it says. Because David knew God's heart, he did everything that was in his will. And there was a correlation between you knowing God's heart and you doing God's will. And I was thinking about for this week what to preach on. And I honestly, I wish I could rewind it a little bit and I could preach this message last week. But I was thinking about what it means to know God's heart. I, I kind of talked about this and I alluded to it a little bit. But for some of you, how you view God is so wrong. How you view God is so poisoned. How you view God is a way that you should not view him. There's this quote, and I think it's A.W. Tozer says this. This is what he says. The most important thing about you is the way that you view God. I, I want you to think about that statement. The most important thing about you and about me is the way that you view God, the way that I view God. Depending on how you view God will determine how you live your life. So I want you to know how you view God matters, how you see God matters. And this is what we're going to talk about today. How are we supposed to view God? Psalm 103, verse 7 through 13. This is what I'm going to talk about. This scripture, this is what it said. He being God revealed his character to Moses. David's writing this no, this is about David. So the life of David is this whole series. David wrote this. He says, he being God revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins and he does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. You know, I, I, yeah, that is a good verse right there. You can read that and you can just go home. That's, that's a good verse. That's a tattoo worthy verse. I don't believe in getting tattoos. I think it's wrong and you should not get tattoos. But uh, I'm just joking, I got tattoos. But I'm just saying that is a beautiful verse. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever like dealt with this before, but have you ever like talked to somebody and you were talking to them, and they were completely convinced on something. In your mind, you were like, yo, there is no way you actually believe this. Now, I, I want to tell you a story. And if this is you, and you believe this, and you have these views, there is zero judgment here. But I remember one time, I was on a trip, and I was talking to this gentleman who I love very dearly. And he's incredible. But we were talking, and he was, I'm talking, going after this, this, this theory that the earth is actually flat. Have you ever heard this before? The flat earth theory. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He was so convinced of this. I'm talking, he had all of the details. He was explaining. I kept asking this question. I'm like, yo, 
why would you, like, why would the government try to trick us into thinking that the earth is not, like, what good does it do? And it's like, oh, well, this and this and this. I'm like, no, that is not a good excuse. Like, why would the world want to play a huge prank on us? And I was trying to understand, and I was trying to ask questions, but here's what I found. This person was so convinced that this theory was truth that no matter what I said, no matter what I did, man, there was nothing that could happen. I mean, there was nothing I could do because he was so convinced. I, I was thinking about the power of being convinced about something. You know, if you get convinced about the right thing, you can change the world. But you know, if you get convinced about the wrong thing, you can ruin your life. What you are convinced about truly does matter. You know what we learn from David? If you look at the life of David and you try to understand who he is, you know one thing that David did right? David was convinced of the most important thing. Earlier I was just saying that we talk about the will of God and you need to know God's heart. You know before you can want to know the heart of God and before you can want to do the will of God, there's something that has to be on the bedrock of your faith. It's something you have to be convinced of. It's something that you have to have a conviction about. And if this thing is wrong, I want you to hear me. If we do not do the topic that I'm about to talk about tonight, everything else in your faith will be wrong. You can try to do everything right. You can try to follow God. But if you miss this piece, what I'm about to talk about, I, I want you to hear me. Your whole entire Christian walk and your whole faith journey can feel like you're running on a hamster wheel, can feel like you're never going to go. You ever feel like you've been trying to move forward in your faith, but you didn't know how? It's like you do the right things and you feel like you're going to the right places and you're saying no to the right things, but it's just like you're on that hamster wheel and you're making no progress. I think a lot of people struggle that a lot more than we would like to say, but here's what I think. I think what it comes down to a lot is the foundation of our faith is built on the wrong thing. And you know what David teaches us? He teaches us the power of what it means to be convinced. I, I was thinking about this question, and this is what I want to ask you tonight. What is the most important thing about your life? What is the most important thing about your life? When you were to have someone, hey, what, what do you think? What are your top priorities? You know, depending on how you answer that question will determine how you live your life. See, if you think this world is all about making money, you know everything that you do, how you live, the action behind it is all about making money. Now, I'm going to be real. I love crypto, and I'm believing right now things are really down. But come on, when things are down, come on, God's always going to raise it up. But for a lot of people, if you make money the main factor, every decision you make, Everything you think about goes through the lens of, okay, this is what I believe is the most important, so this is what I want. Some people, maybe you're like me, I love having fun. Man, I'm just like a fun person. You ever like wake up in the morning and you're like, dude, I know I'm going to have a good day and I'm going to have fun because I'm stuck with me and like I'm fun. Like I'm one of those people that I wake up every morning. My wife's here, by the way. She hasn't been able to come for a while because she pushed out three babies in like three days. Um, but my wife and me are different. See, when I wake up first thing in the morning, I'm talking about immediately. I'm like, shoo ba doo ba doo ba doo ba doo ba day. I'm, I'm singing. I'm having a good time. For her, she needs about 14 hours to wake up. I'm just joking. She needs about 10 minutes or so to wake up. But not for me. Like everything in my life I view, I want to have fun. But this is what I found. If we think in our life the most important thing is for us to have fun, how we live our life will reflect that belief. Because what you believe will determine how you behave. And we live in a culture and we live in a society that is so focused on behavior. What's important in your life? Oh, it's me doing this, doing that, doing this. And we get so focused on behavior. But I want you to hear me. If you want to change your behavior, you know you don't have to actually try to do different things. You actually just have to change what you believe. If you change what you believe, it will determine how you behave. Behavior isn't what matters, it's belief that matters, that turns into behavior. And here's the thing, how you believe about yourself, it really does matter. But I, I want you to hear me, the most important thing about you is not what you believe about yourself. Because you know this, if you want to know why you believe about yourself, what you believe about yourself, simply this, it comes down to this foundation that I was mentioning earlier. It comes down to how do you view God? Oh, how do you view God? You know when Jesus came, you know the reason that he was on this earth? 
He was not coming and he did not come die on a cross for us so he could change our behavior. See, Christianity, and for a lot of you, maybe this is what your perception of faith is. It is behavior modification. Okay, this is what faith is all about. I come in and I go to church, check. I pray, check. I read my Bible, check. I tithe, check. I do this and I do that. It is all about behavior modification. Jesus did not come to change your behavior. Jesus came to change your belief. You know what this word, it's a cuss word in the Christian faith. It means repentance. Repentance, you know what it means to change your mind. And you know what Jesus' main message was? It was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know what he was saying by repent? He was saying this, don't change your action. Because if you come and you try to disciple action, you'll just be a religious Pharisee who shows up. You ever meet one of those religious people and they're like the religious police and they're like, don't do this, don't do that. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you listen to Drake. No, no, you can't do that. Even though you shouldn't, I'm just joking. You do what you want. So uh, to each their own. But we make it all about behavior and we end up being this religious police, okay? I want you to know Jesus is not in to us. Okay, let me disciple your action. Let me change your action. No, he wants to change your belief. And if Jesus changes your belief about yourself, but more than that, if he changes your belief, about who God is. So many people, they're walking around believing bad things about God, wrong things about God. And listen, what you determine about God will determine how you live your whole life. And for so many people, this is the story of your life. If I were to ask you, who do you think God is? You'd be like, oh, he's angry. He ain't angry. Oh, he's mad. No, he ain't mad. He hates me. He don't hate you. Are you serious? David understood this. He understood that there was something about being a God servant, about running after God, about being someone after God's own heart. And this is what David found out, and it's what we need to find out tonight and what we need to know tonight. The most important thing about you in your walk with God is for you to understand this, that God loves you so much. See, the foundation of your faith, hear me tonight, is not you doing good things for God. It's understanding how much God loves you. And if you believe that correctly, I'm talking about if you truly believe that God loves you, if you truly believe that he sees you and knows you and wants real relationship with you and is just there for you, you know what? Your whole entire life will change. And for a lot of you, you hear this, you're like, bro, I get it. God loves me. God loves me. Yeah. But a lot of us, we can say it with our mouth and we can make the, it's head knowledge, but we haven't let it hit our heart. And what tonight, what God wants to do is he wants his love to actually hit your heart. I talked about this last week. I was talking about experiencing God. And I was telling you that for a lot of us, we think just because we can say, say stats about God, oh yeah, I can read John 3.16. Yeah, like 99% of the world can read John 3.16. There's a difference between me reading John 3.16 and actually believe in John 3.16. Because if I read it, it might not change my life. But if I read it, let it hit my heart and I believe it, it will change everything about me. Because it's not about behavior. It's about belief. I don't need to try to behave right. I have to make sure I let God's word do something in my heart. And I believe right. And when I believe right, I'm telling you, you will start to behave correctly. I was talking about last week about doing the will of God and how David did the will of God because he experienced God's heart. You know why he experienced God's heart or you know what it meant to experience God's heart? It was David was obsessed with understanding how much God loved him. David understood this and it's something that we have to know tonight. And this is what I want to talk about. You can only have a heart after God if you understand the love that God has for you. You can only have a heart after God if you understand, not be able to say it. I'm talking about truly understand the love that God has for you. You know, I, I was thinking about this. I'm going to talk about Psalm 103 here in just a minute. But so for so many people, what we make the most important thing about our faith is so twisted. See, when my faith is centered around my love for God, it's completely backwards. Your faith cannot be centered around your love for God. Your faith is meant to be centered around God's love for you. I want you to hear the difference. You do not need to go around bragging about how much you love God. That don't do nothing for no one, even though it's important. You know what you need to brag about? That I have a true revelation of how much God loves me. Because you can only love God based on you understanding how much he loves you and what he did for you. This is what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. It 
says this, we love God because he first loved us. We love God. Why? Because we love God because we did everything right. Nope, that's not it. We love God because we never made a mistake. No, that is not it. David was a murderer. He cheated on his wife. He got someone killed. Like, that's messed up. He did some messed up stuff. But you know what? He had a heart that was after God. Why? Because he understood how much God loved him. We have to understand that our faith is not centered around our love for God. Our faith is centered around his love for me. So in Psalm 103, David is describing God. And he's just explaining this is who he is. He's gone through a lot of experiences. He's gone through a lot of highs and a lot of lows. And he came to two conclusions about the love of God. And I truly believe this. If we can come to the same two conclusions about the love of God, our life will never be the same. And we'll have somebody come up here to the keys. Two things that David believed about God's love. Number one, that God's love is constant. Come on, this is really good news. God's love is constant. Watch this. God's love is always towards me. I'll say it for you. Listen to me. God's love is always towards you. Look what it says in Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. See, David believed this, and it's something that we have to understand, that there is nothing that I can do to keep God from loving me. See, so so many people, this is what happens, and we think, okay, God's love is conditional because everybody else's love seems conditional. So I think as long as I come to church, God loves me. As long as no dust forms on my Bible, you know what? God loves me. As long as I don't make the same old mistake again and again and again, then God loves me. You know what David was saying? He was writing this knowing that he committed murder. He was writing this knowing that he committed mistakes. And this is what he says. Hey, David, he says, I understand, I get this, and I know this, that God's love is unfailing. And I need you to hear me tonight. God's love is perfect. It is towards you. It is for you. And there is nothing that you can do that can stop the love of God. It is just towards you. I remember years ago, I heard someone tell this analogy. And this is what they were trying to explain. The love of God is like a waterfall. Come on, anyone ever seen a waterfall before? Come on, I've been to Hawaii. I've been, I swam through some waterfalls before. Right before I asked my wife to marry me, actually, the same day. It was, it was, it was gnarly. Uh, that's what they say in, in, uh, in Hawaii. But it's like a waterfall. You know the thing about a waterfall? It's this, that a waterfall constantly keeps pouring. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And here, you can get under a waterfall or you can be away from it, but the water's still flowing. That's kind of like how the love of God is. And you need to understand that it is always towards you. It is always flowing. You can either receive it or you can ignore it. And for so many people, they ignore it and they act like it's not there and they act like it's not real. But I want you to know, if your behavior is wrong, it's probably because this. You maybe have been believing a lie that God's love is not constant, that God's love is not for you. It's like, oh yeah, no, God's love is for other people, but it's not for me. No, God's love is for you. God cannot help but love. He is love. It's his character. It's his nature. And it is what is towards you and for you. God loves you you period not a better version of you not when you do better or do more he loves you just like you are right now come on that is good news to understand and that is good news to know and if you truly would believe that tonight I want you to hear me it will change your life forever God loves you his love is constant it's always towards me and the second thing is this that God's love is more powerful than shame Come on, it's so important. God's love is constant. And the second thing that David believed about God's love is that God's love is more powerful than shame. This is what it says in verse 11. It says, for his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. Verse 12, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Listen to that. He has removed our our sins as far as the east is from the west because of god's love is what it says he removed our sin you know what this is trying to tell you and tell me 
that for some of us, the reason we have such a difficult time connecting with God, in meeting with God, in being able to encounter God is simply because this, because of the shame that we walk in carrying, bring in it's like there's a block we can't connect with god we can't receive from god we feel like we can't lift our hands in worship we feel like we can't come close to people or talk to people because our shame i want you to know i have never seen a time when shame has been more prevalent and more i'd say just attacking a generation and this is the things for some people you know how they deal with shame they come in here and they maybe still come to church, but they just are so disengaged and they're closed off and they act like God's far away or they act like they're too cool. And that's why they talk to their friends. And that's why, because they're trying to avoid letting God do something in their heart because they're scared. And I want you to hear me, God, whatever shame you have, whatever brokenness, whatever thing you've been going through or dealing with, listen to me. God's love is better and God's love is stronger. This is what the life of David teaches us. That his love, God's love, is more powerful than our shame. See, for a lot of people, what happens is we walk into church, and all you can think about is this is what I did. I watched this last night. I said this. I stole this. I smoked this. I did that. And we have the list of everything that we did wrong. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to remind you of what you did. But I want you to know what Jesus wants to do is remind you of what's already been done. And hear me. What Jesus did is more powerful than whatever it is you've done. What Jesus did is more powerful than whatever it is that you have done. And I want you to hear me. This does not mean that you can sin and do whatever you want and leave here. That you can come here, hear a message, and then walk out and do whatever. No. God wants you to live a holy life. He wants you to live a life according to his word and according to his will. But what I'm trying to communicate is that if you do not understand how much he loves you, how much he needs you, how much he wants to use you, you know what? You will never be able to walk out the things that he has for you. I love the life of David because it teaches us God's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for you to try to figure it all out and do it all right and never make a mistake. No, he's trying for you to understand that it is so important for you to get it and grasp how good his love is, how big his love is, how wide his love is. And if you do not understand the love of God, hear me. If it is not the foundation of your faith, you will not be able to last. Because when tragedy hits, when brokenness hits, when trials hit, you just won't be able to keep moving forward. I'm telling you right now, this, the biggest issue we have, I think, in America for the next generation, for people who are trying to follow God, I'm talking about for next generation, your age group that are Christians, it's simply this. I think people maybe are leaving the church because they are forgetting to go after the most important thing, which is truly being able to grasp how important it is that we understand how much God loves us. It's not behavior modification. I'm not going to get up here and try to tell you what to do. But I am going to get up here and tell you what we're supposed to believe. And what the Bible teaches us is that God's love is more powerful than any mistake, than anything that's happened, than anything that, is, that we've ever gone through. I will never forget this. And I've lived this. I remember when I was, you've heard this story before, when I was a young dude. I was so young. And I remember when I got taken advantage of for the first time. I remember getting taken advantage of and I was filled with so much shame. Listen to me, I could not even come in a room like this and lift up my hands. Because I was filled with so much shame, you know what I did? I tried to pretend like I hated God. And I tried to blame God because of what I went through. And I want you to hear me. What happened was eventually I got so broken, I got so desperate that I said, I'm willing to do anything to change. And my, my, my cousins went to this church. We were in this small building over there. And I got invited to church, just got out of jail, walked into that building. And I'm telling you, after so much pain, living with so much shame, in a moment, I experienced the love of God. And I talked about this last week, that you have to know his heart to want to do his will. Listen to me. You will only want to know God's heart if you understand how much he loves you. He has a radical love, a perfect love. It's not based on your performance. It's based on the price that Jesus paid. And I truly believe that tonight it is this love that is after you. You can only love God if you understand how much he loves you. 
Man, I'm telling you, if some of you would just let God's love hit your heart, everything about your life would change. It's a constant love. It's a good love. And Jesus wants you. Will you stand up with me tonight? God's love is constant. And God's love is more powerful than shame. God's love is constant. And God's love is more powerful than shame. I want to put this quote up one more time. I just read it. The devil wants to remind you of what you did. But Jesus wants to remind you of what he has done. When Jesus, what Jesus has done is stronger than whatever it is you did. I felt this as I was just preaching. I was figuring out, Lord, how do you want me to end it? What do you want me to say? But like for some people, this is just, it's shame has kept you from experiencing the love of God. And I want you to hear me. It is God's love that will transform everything you know about the world, everything you know about life. You want to do great things with your life, I promise you, if you let this revelation hit you that God's love is perfect and it's perfectly towards you, it will change your life forever. With every head bowed in this place.